great. So welcome everyone. Um, this evening we are with Stephen Paul Day and Sabella Peretti, and um, you're here for another Wheaton Conversations. And again, we'd love to hear from you where you're listening in from and, and how you heard about this program this evening. Um, my name is Marcy Peterson. I'm the Marketing Technology Director at Wheaton Arts. I'm a white female in my mid-50s with brown hair and highlights. Tonight, I'm wearing a black and white top, so you can pick me out sometimes. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm broadcasting from Southern New Jersey, which is the, traditionally the land of the Lenai Lenape. Um, again, we'd love to hear how you heard about this program. Um, I'd like to point out that there is a live transcript. Um, I'll get, well, I'll have to get that started in just a moment, but you can turn on closed captioning if you need to once I get that started. There are two places for you to participate, and one is the chat where I've already directed you to. But if you want to ask Stephen and Spell uh, questions, you can do that in the Q&A. Um, that's the best place to do that so that we can um, keep track of your questions. Um, and they'll be answering your questions throughout the evening. We want to thank our sponsors, PNC Arts Alive and the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass for supporting this program this evening. And for future programs, please consider supporting Wheaton Arts through memberships, donations, and shopping. I'll be dropping a link into the chat box so that you can follow up um, and investigate our membership. And don't forget to um, check out our shop.wheatonarts.org for lots of beautiful <laughs> items. And I will also be sharing with you the link for the upcoming um, Wheaton Conversations. And I have the pleasure now of introducing Pamela Wakeman, my coworker, and she will be the moderator um, for your Q&A today. And she'll um, ask your questions of our guests. So I will hand it over to you now, Pam. Thank you, Marcy. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see so many familiar uh, names here. I'm so glad that you're joining us once again. Um, I am Pamela Weichman. For those who do not know me, I am the Director of Education and Artist Services at Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center. I'm a white female in my mid-30s with long brown hair and blue eyes. Tonight, I am wearing a dark purple sweater that probably almost looks black on your screen. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I also am broadcasting from Southern New Jersey, traditionally the land of the Lene Lenape. As Marcy mentioned during our program, I will be monitoring the Q&A. I invite you to enter in your questions and I will pose those questions um, to both Stephen and Sabella as they are relevant to the topics that we are discussing. It is now my pleasure to introduce them. Our first guest is Stephen Paul Day. He is an avid seeker of the curious and wonderful. He lives in New Orleans and works part-time in Berlin, Germany. He derives pleasure from the unusual and is deeply motivated by experimenting with history. Since 1992, Stephen has participated in four fellowships at Wheaton Arts. I do believe that is our record. He and Sabella are currently in residence as one of our 50th anniversary guest artists. Our next guest this evening is Sabella Peretti. Sabella was born in Germany, where the rich tradition of glassmaking influenced the direction of her, her artistic training and the abundant Bavarian forests inspired her choice of landscape as a predominant theme in her work. Using two-dimensional kiln form panels and three-dimensional lost wax castings, Peretti composes narratives about the beautiful and poetic yet disrupted relationship between humans and the natural world. Since 1992, Sabella has participated in three fellowships. We are thrilled to have both Stephen and Sabella in our studio from now until March 19th. Thank you both for being here with us. So first of all, thank you for everybody who's joining and also thank you to Pam and Marcy and Wheat Nord having us again for this short term residency. Um, it's wonderful to be back 
<laughs> because so much happened here for me in the past and it's still with me very deeply. And I, I always felt like Wheaton really made me to the person I am. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, it's so nice to see people chatting. I see people's names that we love. And I just saw my brother who lives in oh, Ecuador just said hello. And um, I think the last time I was here was maybe at least 10 years ago. And I'm so happy to be back and just walking around here. We've only been here for three days, but walking around the nostalgia and the beauty of this um, Wheaton Arts has just really in, in inspired us already. And very, very pleased to be back here. Thank you. Once upon a time, a, lo a long time ago, 1989 in Frauenau, Germany, okay? That was your part? <laughs> no, this is your part. Anyway, um, so you saw a beautiful image of, of the village, Frauenau, where also Urban Eich, both for us, friend and mentor, was born and lived. And for me, also important, I um, went to school for three years in the village of Frauenau to learn uh, to work with glass. And the interesting thing about Frauenau, besides being a wonderful and another beautiful gem in the, in the world, the history of glass making there started around 600 years ago. But one of the greatest gifts of Fraunau was Erwin Eich, okay? Erwin is a very famous and one of the most famous and most important glass artists. And I, I hate using the word glass artist. Erwin is a very important artist in Germany. And, um, Okay. So Irwin, I met him also while I stayed in, 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 in the Bavarian forest. I met him, he became my mentor and he was the one, um, I mean, I came more from traditional glass techniques and he really pushed me to bring the material, to push it further and use it as an art material and just go for it. And he encouraged me to, to um, study art and sculpture and painting. So he became very influential for, for my path. Okay. And um, of course, the same for myself. I've had the privilege of working in Fraunau with Erwin for the last 33 years and was actually a student with Erwin in 1984 at Pilchuck. Um, So um, it's maybe still very touching, but Irvin, he passed away, uh, not in January. And uh, we were so close that it, it still affects us, especially when you talk about it. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, but he's living on because he created this amazing school build work and his whole spirit and uh, go <laughs> and um, vision will continue what's amazing. And one, one of the most important things for us is that Erwin brought Sibylla and I together at Buildwork in Frauenau, okay? And uh, so Stephen and I, we met there. So we going back, it was like nine, 1998 and- we, 89. 89, sorry. And we could had a, this kind of um, natural insect, ins, in, in, intuitive connection and we, we started to, to um, paint on beer decals while we were visiting Cologne and uh, talking about art ideas and doing bar hoppings and we created all these drawings on this kind of um, little notebooks and, and beer decals. And of course that connection at that time was a little difficult for me because um, Sibylla was um, in a relationship with somebody and I was married at the time, but I secretly 
took photographs of her and put her in my notebooks and, and kept her in my memory. And um, it was unfortunate because this was in Germany and I was living in the States at the time. So when I left Germany, okay. So when Stephen left Germany, left me behind, he gave me this little present with a note, we have to apply for residency at Wheaton Village. Okay. Lo and behold, fate had it that we received a residency at Wheaton Village at the time, Wheaton Village. <laughs> and Sibylla immediately, when we got there, she immediately jumped on the little train and decided that she was now part of Wheaton Village, okay? Wheaton Village at the time was a little different than it is now. Traditional glass blowing facility uh, with some wonderful old white men. Okay. That's your favorite place. So, um, of course, for me, it was also actually the first time or, or the more important time to come to the United States. And the first place Stephen took me was Wildwood, was also located in South Jersey. And I loved this place. And it changed Sibylla quite a bit to come to the States. You can tell already by how she looked after that, okay? So now we switch to, um, to a few pieces we did um, together in our, during our first residency at Wheaton. And we focused um, on uh, twins and, and the connection as we, we basically Stephen work, worked on the right side and me on the left side. And we made together that one kind of piece where it seems like a, a twin and reflects on the, our connection. I don't know how else to Well, I mean, the other thing that. that was great about this was that we got to learn, Sibylla had never done castings before, so I was teaching her a little bit about doing castings, and Wheaton offered this opportunity to use this strange glass and make these um, Siamese twins. You can go to the next slide. And um, so we were using black glass and this honey glass. I don't know where the glass came from at the time at Wheaton, um, but it was really wonderful for us to use this, and also um, to use it in the context of um, the idea of the twin and how we could work together on the yeah. same sculpture like we did with the beer decals and drawings. And, and in this piece, especially, you see the, the wanting to join, but also the two individuals who are trying to also pull away. So this all is embodied in this uh, early sculpture. Okay. So, and, and I put this, this one in because it was one of my first uh, glass castings and it was also done here and it, it was basically um, from scrap material I found in the dumpster and for me it was always and until to now very fascinating to um, the piece is titled conjoined twins to uh, create um, like the strongest physical bond human can achieve and that's for me the Siamese twin idea. Okay. And um, the, like old Joe and the, the glass blowers, they, they told me a lot of fairy tales while I was here. And one was um, about Louise. She was the one who wanders. She's a, she was a ghost and she wanders the grounds of Wheaton with the goal of stealing the paperweights at night. So I dedicated um, that kind of uh, object to her in her memory. And it's preserved forever. And these are a few pieces I also um, created during this time. And um, I always, my work until today reflects on the fragility of life. And in these container pieces, the goal is to, to basically protect uh, life actually. Okay. And I also was always very inspired by um, scientific 
displays and and pieces in this mm -hmm. and it's for me um what is extremely important that something is enclosed and protected but also is connected and has a a connection to the outside and also to give the 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 individual which are inside the opportunity to breathe and connect to the outside environment but at the same time to uh, protect them at the same time i was working with the idea of bottles as well but my my focus was a little bit more on history and and um folklore and, but I decided to do this piece um, with the bottles. It's the history of Wheaton. And I was very fascinated with uh, Frank Wheaton and how they, the, the building was or, was, or the foundation was started. Um, and the uh, piece on the right is a portrait of Edgar Allan Poe. And what's, what's nice about this for me was that there's a certain quality to the glass that you were using at Wheaton. I don't know where it comes from. It was maybe from the factory or something, but it always had this very kind of rock-like quality. Okay. After Wheaton, um, there was a, a moment where Sibylla and I had finally been able to get together and be together. And uh, then all of a sudden Wheaton was over and we had to go away from each other. Yes, I went back to Germany, Stephen to Australia, Japan, and then, is that the right order? And then we uh, re met actually in Wheaton for the Glass Lovers Weekend. That's right. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, the Glass Lovers Weekend. You remember those things? And, <laughs> and then we, I, I, Sibylla and I said, we have to get back together. This was a year later, and we were still separated. We had written each other thousands of letters with wonderful drawings and objects. And finally, we said, we have to get together. Let's go to Wheaton again. And so we made, I remember we made it to there and then immediately we left. <laughs> so we, we went out on a trip from New Jersey down to- And ended up- In- New Orleans. Okay, next slide. <laughs> There. So very obviously, that's us in New Orleans. Okay. And this is our house that we decided to uh, house sit while we were in New Orleans for that time period. But unfortunately, um, they decided to sell the house and we had to leave. Okay. Next. So that was a hard thing for us. What are we gonna do now? So we ended up being nomads for a couple of years. Yes, probably even longer. Um, so we, we just started to travel and we spent uh, extensive actually time, almost two years in Mexico. Okay, next. And in Mexico, we, we didn't have any facility to do any glass work or castings. So we were really focusing on just drawings. Um, and these are two of my pieces. I was very inspired by the surrounding. I, I collected uh, cloths from the, from the streets and uh, incorporated it into the, the drawing. It's again about human condition and also our uh, connection to nature, what was already at that time um, very interesting to me. Okay. Um, at the same time, I was working on a, an exhibition I knew I was going to have uh, about Tennessee Williams, who was, um, of course, everybody knows Tennessee Williams, the writer, but he um, represented for me a certain energy about New Orleans. So um, this was, and I had no way to work with glass or anything or sculpture. So it was all about drawing at that time. Okay. That then, was a brief, brief moment. Then finally we made it back to New Orleans. Yes. Yeah, and we finally got our studio in New Orleans. But unfortunately that studio didn't have any facility for glass. Yes. That's so true. we did, but at the same time we were getting these um, opportunities to do collaborative shows together. Next. 
And this was actually one of our first collaborations at Baba Mavis in Seattle, based on um, fairy tales, narratives. Um, but it's, it's very obvious to see the influence that Wheaton had on us with the bottles at the time. But at, at the same time, we didn't have enough facility to make um, other shows. So we decided, oh, let's try again at, and get another residency at Wheaton. And lo and behold, next, the fairy Yay. tale came true. Yes, we were extremely lucky to receive another fellowship. Okay, next. And um, I, so I, I, I focused at that time on, on larger uh, kiln castings. Um, amazing opportunity in Wheaton, you could, you could melt your own colors. Um, and this was beautiful. The, these two pieces are based on a, on a narrative, left narrative on a boy and right of somebody else. And the, I started to insert um, crystals into the work and they can see can be seen either way as a wound, but also as a healing component. Okay. At the same time, I was still working on the Tennessee Williams show and this is the character from Streetcar named Desire. But what was interesting to me was that was the first time I could use, uh, do larger castings and at this point, incorporating sulfide, sulfides cast into the glass. Next. Oh. At the same time, we started doing uh, more collaborative shows together. And this particular one was called Why Mythos? And it was about mythology. But what was, we got to do again, we got to show the beer decals that we made um, some years back and then create pieces with that in this context of this exhibition. At the same time, we um, also, because we were at Wheaton, we could do large sculptures and these, these pieces were made, the sculptural pieces were made, the castings were made, and they're, they're relatively big castings. And at the same time, we're, we're continuing to work with the idea of the bottle and um, the narrative that's inside of the, the container, the vessel. I have a question uh, for Sabella. What was the process like incorporating crystals into kiln casting? I mean, the, the process is very simple. You just, when you do the kiln, the, the, the wax positive for the kiln casting, you just have a little area where you later insert the crystal. And, in cold process. You understand? Is that, does that make sense? Thank you. I, I don't think they can respond that quickly, but thank you. Okay. Your turn, circus. Oh, oh and, and this was a very fun show. Um, uh, it, we, it, it was titled Circus uh, at Trevor Gallery in Seattle back in 19 something and it was a, a big installation of all kind of different objects and 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 fun things related to circus and it, i think it typifies what we do we didn't start with the idea of like oh we're going to make cast this or cast that we said let's talk about circus and then we went to circuses we read about circus we thought about we lived the circus and then everything that we did whether it was a drawing or a painting or a drawing on the wall or um, these these two glass pieces um, uh, they all fit into the idea the idea was what was most important everything else fits because we can do everything we could make sculpture we can make blown glass we can make bronze whatever, and it all fit into this idea, this narrative of, of circus. Yeah, and these were like two characters, like Liliana, the tra trapeze artist, and then I think Joey. Okay. Glass, everything. Oh, now we're in this. This was our first major exhibition together, and this uh, exhibition was called 1822. This was at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans in uh, 2001. Um, and th the basic premise of this was 1822 was two years after 
And this um, show was done two years after 9-11. And we were thinking about the effect that 9-11 had on the children um, going through this experience. And of course, you can relate that to COVID now or to the children in Ukraine. And we also again created bottles and we tried to uh, create a safe environment like a refuge for the children. Okay. At the same time, we were working with a new idea of drawings. It's back a little bit to the idea of the beer decal or the beer coasters that we always drew together. Like Sibylla, we'd sit at a bar and we'd have a beer and we drink and we draw a little bit on a beer and then I draw a little bit and then she draw a little bit on the coaster. And then eventually some beautiful drawings would happen. And we decided to do this in a series of work called Suicide Notes that um, we're talking about an artist that would commit suicide, but also beforehand was um, making drawings about things that were important in life. It was a positive um, things in life. Yeah, it was also about in general what would somebody back, who back. what would somebody who departs or has to depart would leave behind, and it's it's a combination of a poem, sometimes just a word and an, a drawing on a napkin. They're all done on napkins. Next, were these drawings the final pieces, or did they inspire other pieces in glass? Ever final? Wait, no. No. Oh yeah, not hundred um, percent. At that time, it's interesting because at that particular show was the first time we did the drawings, the napkins. Um, this um, series is continues today, and we've done over a thousand of these drawings, and we've made walls of them, and you'll see some more of them as time goes on. And in the end, they turned into glass. It How shows at the end. How closely do you follow the drawings that you make? Do you do multiple drawings or sketches for um, like one piece of work? Well, on the napkins, they're they're intuitive, so they're 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 done in the moment. Mm -hmm. How about your other pieces? When it comes to sketches translating into a final piece? Yes, I mean today I work differently. Uh, I do lay out certain imagery and of course research and and what I want to do and will use all this but in and normally I work more like that I um, start at one point and then the work grows from that it's not all completely planned or laid out 100%. Great thank you. The, um, the, sh the last show, the 1822 show, was at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans. And at that time, we finally had this, our studio at Studio Inferno in New Orleans. The, the thing that was that we were missing uh, an oven or kilns to work with. So again, as fate would have it, we applied to Wheaton and lo and behold, I don't believe in fate, but fate <laughs> gave us another residency. The third one for me. Next. This is an actual photo <laughs> at Wheaton, the only one I have. And at the time we were making um, um, larger sculptures in glass because it, we were so um, needy for, an, for ovens. And to just to come here and make um, larger castings and experiment with stuff. This is what Wheaton's all about. And it was just an amazing um, opportunity for us to come back and make these pieces. This is a larger piece. Sibylla thinks it looks like a, a New Orleans piece. I don't know. It has that, that kind of decadence. Yeah. Decadence and Napoleon. Nope. These are over life size. The heads are over life size. So you can see the kind of size. We can never do this in New Orleans. Okay. And these pieces, finally, I mean, from all the work that you do at Wheaton, um, 
it, uh, it gives you the opportunity to create exhibitions with these with this work. And this is just one of the outcomes of an exhibition I did after one of my residencies at Wheaton. Oh, it's me. Yes, and, and during this time, I mean, we, we went a little bit different directions, but I also still continued um, the, yeah, the kind of twin or sibling series and uh, tried to connect always two characters together, try to, to create a harmony between the two. Next. And this is a detail I was, for me, it was also very important to find a special, very intimate um, connection between two uh, figures. And in this also, and also to find a, a different communication. And in, in this piece, I wanted to focus on the, um, the, the sense of hearing and how we connect through hearing to each other. And like nature always was important, our relationship to it, our in, in, inability to connect to it and to find balance with it, but our ongoing search of um, finding a way how to make it happen. And left is a, is a large casting, it's all life size, and on the right side is a wall panel in glass. how we wanted minute to switch this. This marks a very a crazy time in our life, what also changed everything. And it's, um, it calls Katrina. And with all this catastrophes who are happening right now, but this was one, what's hard to forget, 2005. And for, it, it's the same, not the same, but it was hard to work. But at one point I said, I have to make a piece and I, went to all the flooded areas, collected plants and used them um, to create this uh, triptych, was I called how to breathe underwater. So the, the need to find a possibility as humans to, to be able to breathe in flooded areas underwater, that was the theme of this. And I think people here can relate to that now after the last time. At the same time, a, a, a year later, we were invited to go to Berlin um, to work as a resident artist at the, at the Freies Museum in Berlin. And um, they were really specifically wanted us to do um, an, uh, 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 an installation based on our experience uh, at, during Katrina in New Orleans. And this was the work that we did for the, um, at least a portion of the work that we did for this uh, residency. Sure. I have a question here from somebody um, about, I believe a, the previous piece, uh, were the fine cracks, quote unquote, in the glass uh, casting etched? No, I, I, use, I mean, it's very complex, but I use a lot of paper with, with glass, like tissue paper, <clears throat> and that paper, when I apply it to the back of the glass creates these kind of folds, mm. and the, and the plan is it's real. I mean, it's it's just attached. Also, it's layered in between the paper and the glass. Mm. Thank you. Well, it happened again, <laughs> two thousand and seven, I think. That's you. I, yeah, I got a residency at Wheaton. I don't know how it happened, but I got a residency at Wheaton. Um, and I was absolutely thrilled to be back with my friends. Um, at this time, I was really interested because in, in, the, in the past, Wheaton was, or maybe still a lot of people do it, but there was a paperweight aspect to Wheaton. And I was really involved with, you know, how do you elevate the idea of the paperweight? And for me, it was through the usage of making sulfides because sulfides are malleable. You can mold them, you can paint on them and create um, different uh, narratives inside of the glass. I love the idea of the inclusion in glass. And um, these are some of the pieces 
that I made um, at Wheaton. Luckily, I worked with great glass blowers here at the time. I think Deborah Cheresco was working with me and a, few, and a lot of other people. Um, okay, next. <laughs> As you can go on and on. I know, I could talk forever <laughs> about sulfides. Um, these are some more of the works. These are more, con uh, I still do a lot of these. And in fact, um, I'm, I'm here right now working on a, a new series of these sulfides. So these are a few of the pieces. And this is the one on the right is more of a, a completed figure or a completed object um, using the sulfides and paintings inside of the glass. So um, another residency, very important too, was at uh, Kohler Art and Industry Program offers this amazing um, residency program, and we were again super lucky to get this together in the in the um, ceramic area. I, I don't know if I have to explain Kohler, but I think most people are familiar with uh, the company. Just go in your bathroom. <laughs> your sink or your toilet will probably be. These are some of the pieces I made at Kohler. These are all made of the vitreous china or toilet ceramic. And um, it was wonderful, again, to go to residencies are so amazing because you have to go there and relearn um, the way that you think about things and the way that you think about how to make something and how to in input that technique into your own narrative. And these are some of the pieces I came up with, these fire sticks. And my focus was um, on laying on feral children. Uh, feral children are children who grew up with um, no or very little uh, social, social contact. And uh, for me, the fascination also lays in, in this question, how does isolation affects a human being. And also another important question went through my mind, um, how if uh, isolation maybe um, connects you closer to nature. So I made these portraits of a uh, genie, the feral child and another one, big door. And so I worked, I worked with imagery I, I take from documentations. And this was a documentation about a genie, the feral child. She was discovered in, in the 70s and li lived like all her life isolated in, in one room. I, I don't want to get too much into it. It takes too long. And exciting at Cola, I was able, what I always had in my mind to, to become really life-size and I um, modeled this life-size uh, genies. And this also, um, this time at the Kola residency encouraged me also to work large scale in glass. And um, that's one of my, uh, I call them snow children. They're inspired by, by a Russian fairy tale. And it's about uh, very briefly about um, fragility of life, but also resilience and continuation and connection to nature. And that's cast in white glass. This is also large casting in white. And again, you see trying to, that I try to always connect to individual people. That was go so quick now. It's okay, it's good. Okay. And uh, this is more my, my, I call it my recent work. And it's for me, um, I call it my landscapes. And I'm very interested in landscapes that are very temporal, um, that will, vanish soon either way because of human expansion or natural disasters and where we live in Louisiana it's it's mostly like um, lost landscape due to flooding and this is an image a photograph um, I start with and I took this uh, down the street where we live at the Mississippi River 
And so, and, and I use this photograph more or less like a staging, like a stage setting and uh, collage other images into that photograph. And this is a final um, wall piece composed out of um, glass plates, opalescent glass plates. <laughs> yes. Yes, Beth. Thank you. <laughs> so very quick, uh, I love always to, to create safe islands, I call them. You know, that's what you're really looking for when you have lived in, in flood, during flooding, you, you try to find the island, like the safe place, the refuge. And I still continued always to make also um, kiln castings. You see on the right side, the panther. I choose the panther as a Florida panther. I choose um, that animal because mm -hmm. it's also an endangered animal. And this is a very recent piece, um, a little bit encouraged, I think during COVID, I decided to eliminate um, the human presence. And I just wanted to create an, basically an environment for animals, um, areas which were left by humans and basically the, the animals create with the remaining artifacts from us, create their own kingdom that is basically the idea so people always ask the, about the pearls for me the the pearl, pearls are it's a, it's an an object or it's something what's made by nature it's but we as humans um because of our how you call that greed we made it to something desirable and something what we what I don't know the word right now but it's just so except we're using it so excessively and then just leave it behind and for me it's very um, a nice metaphor to use these pearls and give them basically to the land I mean it was left in the land but the animals use them to to build their own uh, new world something like this Right, does that make sense? And these are just samples from single animals, very recent pieces. And you can see them in two weeks at an exhibition. I don't know. Where is the exhibition? At Heller Gallery, oh, sorry. Okay. And these, these two, they were also um, it's a little bit inspired by the pandemic. Um, and the left, it's like the, because the pandemic was about in, introspection, but also about being alerted and awake. And I, I also thought because of, we really learned how to communicate through our eyes. So that was also um, an aspect of, of uh, when I made these two uh, glass panels. <laughs> oh, that was just for fun. We just thought we'd like to see ourselves again. Um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few shows from me, and then we're going to end this thing. So next, please. Um, in 2009, no, 2016. Wow, we're getting up there. Um, I was really fortunate to receive another um, residency at the Kohler Foundation. Um, this time I was um, super happy to have the residency at the Iron Foundry. An amazing experience. I, it's hard to, I try to, to give a, a feeling of the ambiance of this amazing factory which is dirty and grimy and loud and full of iron particles and people pouring 10 billion tons of iron a day. Um, but it was amazing to be able to go there and create work um, using this uh, facility. I'm not gonna go through all the pieces I did there. There's only one piece I'm really happy about, very proud of. And this is a piece called The Emigrant. 
And um, I came up with this idea about a child who came to America and wrapped himself and cloaked himself in the American flag and um, ended up in my mind um, working at, at a place called Col a place like Kohler where they encouraged in the time they encouraged immigrants to come there and work. It wasn't like we don't want immigrants. They encouraged the immigrants because the Kohler factory was founded by um, Austrians, by um, <coughs> themselves immigrants. So I um, had this piece cast. It's 600 pounds of iron. And it was an amazingly difficult piece to cast. Next. <clears throat> So this is a little bit of the process going through something like this. First, you have to come up with the, uh, the idea and then um, make the uh, a, a giant sand mold for this piece. This is like a coffin size mold. Um, and once the piece comes out of the mold, um, then you have to finish the piece. And it's a very, very long process. My dream for this piece would, would be that it would stand at the American House, which is a house um, built uh, for the workers, and a, a facility for the workers at Kohler. And um, the, there was a part of the building called the Immigrant Room, which is, I guess, a restaurant or something. But it was wonderful that I said, oh, the piece has to go there. And next. There the piece now stands in, in homage to all the immigrants that uh, built this amazing factory. Next. Um, a more recent exhibition from me, Queen of Mirth. Um, also, it's a little bit like Wheaton. When you come to Wheaton and do a residency, it gives you this opportunity to make a lot of work that you can later use as, in an exhibition. Kohler was the same for me. Um, at this time period, I wasn't doing much glass, but I was doing a lot of sculpture and bronze. And uh, Kohler allowed me to do pieces in iron. And this is a piece uh, in the, in, this is a very large uh, matchbox. It's a uh, blown up matchbox, <laughs> Queen of Mirth, um, showing a lot that I, I, I make most of my work now is through painting, but um, the piece in the middle is an iron, a large iron piece um, called For the Love of Lincoln. And uh, again, another matchbox. And you can see a little bit that I'm very involved with history and ideas of, of how to use the idea of history and work. Okay, next. This is a typical exhibition for me. This is from that exhibition. I just show this um, because for me, um, when I do an exhibition, for me, the exhibition is one piece. So it's hard for me to separate pieces out, but a lot of those same pieces were in this uh, exhibition. Next. This is the most recent exhibition I had um, called Now she, she Sings, Now She Sobs, Now She Sings. And I made this e exhibition in, in general to be part of um, a prospect biennial that we have in New Orleans. And the idea for this was um, looking back at uh, historical New Orleans and how we live today in New Orleans as a hybrid of Victorian times or Victorian uh, qualities and historical New Orleans. New Orleans, New Orleans is a museum. Yeah, so many people have come in and say, oh, you live in a museum. And it's very true that we somehow assimilate um, these historical uh, visual uh, things that we live through and somehow combine them with contemporary stuff. Next. I'd like to take a moment to go back to the piece, uh, the immigrant that included the flag. Yeah. We have a question from somebody um, that the flag inspired them to ask if either or both of you use other found objects when modeling cast glass pieces. All the time. <laughs> I do. I mean, I live for that. Um, most of the work I do is, is sort of a collage of uh, found objects and then 
reassembled into a hybrid object. Yes, and for me it's the same. I mean, when, when you remember back the landscapes, I um, normally collect uh, things I find in these sites and I make molds and slump the glass and use them as slump molds. So that, that object ba basically becomes a permanent part of that um, wall panel and the, and the glass landscape at the end. Um. If you go back, uh, uh, just one slide. Um, in this piece, in these bottles, which again are inspired, there's partially inspired by, by being at Wheaton. And Wheaton in the past was created a lot of apothecary bottles and pharmacy bottles. And a lot of these bottles that I use here are historical bottles. And some of them are Wheaton bottles actually that I find and then uh, create the narrative in, inside of the bottle. My father um, also was a scientist and inspired me a lot to use these kind of chemical bottles. Um, and anyway, the next one. Oh, Which one? The bottles. Uh, um, this is a t this is these are the sculptures that were in the piece, and these these pieces were um, a mix of Victorian objects and uh, objects from Home Depot. It's hard to see, and I didn't show a lot of the slides, but um, they also incorporate uh, sulfide, photographic sulfides that are cast inside of the glass. And that's something that I learned how to do at Wheaton when I was here. So, so I'm showing this to say that, you know, Wheaton, even though this was a long time before, I mean, Wheaton was a long time before I made this work, it's still with me and it's still, um, uh, has inspired me to this to to create these kind of pieces. What's and the title of this? This is called "End of End of the Empire," and it has a historical um, context to it because the in the in the show of, about New Orleans, there was a time when Napoleon was very important because we're a French, you know, and. Uh, founded by the French, uh, Louisiana. But at, at some point, uh, Napoleon became sort of like passe there. And this is a, a, a picture, uh, depiction of, for me, the idea of Napoleon being, you know, out of fashion at the time, let's say. But it's also a little bit how we're feeling right now. Yeah, it, you know, it doesn't so, need to be necessary, Napoleon. No, it's like, uh, we're tired of this, you know, boom. Um, I love this piece. So. It's all black glass. Okay. More. Oh, I forgot about this. Damn. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, very quick, like, I think that's really the, the very final. Um, we did a, a, a show at the Huntsville Museum of Art titled Connections, where we both connected. Connected. <laughs> we just have, a, I think, a few slides. Marcy, next, please. Just an installation shot. Um, do you want to say anything specific? Specific. Well, it was a, It was again the the last um, collaborative show that we did together, and it's very and easy. To, uh, it's very easy to see um, how how we can fit together. Um, so, there's so many similarities between our works, whether it's the busts or the laying figures or the drawings that get on the walls. Yeah, I mean, just going back to that earlier question from some listener. Uh, so the, the paper napkins uh, notes you see on that wall in the back, I think next we have a, a, a detail. We created the glass notes. Marcy, can you maybe switch? No, I thought we have the glass notes. We do. But in a later photo. Next. So these were just um, pieces from uh, sculptures from this exhibition. I was just trying to, to, to make the point that um, a lot of the work was about um, the relationship between oneself or individuals. And this is very similar themes that Sybil and I always have worked on together. Yeah, it's just emphasizing the connection of two living humans or creatures. Next. 
I have a question um, from Beth Littman. Can you, <laughs> can you each speak further about the role of the narrative in your work? Does the stories fold okay. slash evolve as you make the work? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna tackle that for a second. Um, I'm a little bit different than Sibylla because my narratives are usually more um, structured than hers. So I usually would take a historical uh, paradigm and then work into that a kind of narrative that I want to show off. In other words, Sibylla is more poetic than I am. So her narrative, and I'll let her address that. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like that I do need a starting point and then I start somewhere and then through that process, I find it that something else evolves and happens and, and then I go that path. And when I'm into an idea, of course, that's all you're thinking. So you, you look around and everything is filtered through this idea and you see things which you want to um, make part of the narrative. But it's not all, for me, it's, it's never all already there. It's just like the glimpse of an idea, then it all starts. That's why I always panic a lot when I, you know, when I don't know how to realize things because I have to really work on it. I'm not a, somebody who plans it all the way through. Is that, is that the answer for the question, Beth? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope so. So in this final image, well, it's not quite the very, very calm, but it's very close. Um, uh, we had decided that we wanted to make the napkins, we, we wanted to make them more permanent because the napkins are so fragile and they, they over time, they, they kind of just disappear. And it, like with the jars and the bottles of preserving things and preserving the children or giving them, giving them a safe place, we found a way to make large sulfides and a sulfide is just a material that can exist within glass, right? So we made large sulfides and then encased them in, in flat glass and then ended up with these pieces, the glass notes. Yeah, this way they are preserved, but they still have that kind of fragile feel because they are basically encased in glass. And if you would, the next slide will show you a detail of one of them. I will not talk too much about that specific goal. Oh. Oh. Yeah, done. Right, we're going to say if you've never seen the sea, it doesn't matter because you can always come to Wheaton Village. Damn, it's a whole hour. Yeah, we have to quit. It's an hour. Yeah. Pam, you didn't tell us to shut up yet. <laughs> well, you, you were saying so many important things. So um, I want to encourage everybody, if you do have a question, we'll, we'll take a couple more before we end here. Um, I just have a question while they're typing in, if, if they want to type in. Um, you both have mentioned New Orleans, and I know that's one of your places that you often call home because you're, you're based there to some extent, as well as Germany. What first drew you to New Orleans that first time you that you went there and what kind of made you stay? Well, <laughs> I mean, that's that that was an easy call for me because I grew up in Louisiana. So New Orleans was always on my, my radar and I had spent a lot of time in New Orleans and I had a feeling that Sibylla would like New Orleans. I don't know why, but um, we had traveled all over the country and we went to Mexico and um, we finally went to New Orleans, I think, to see my family or something, and Sibylla absolutely fell in love yeah. with it. I mean, uh, there's so many aspects, but, you know, the whole cultural background, but it's also an extreme um, free and liberal city, mm -hmm. and you can't really compare it with anything else I saw in the United States. Um, but there are a lot of things, you know, 
it's the, music. And it's maybe the most European city in the state. But you can even compare it to, to Europe. Mm. It's very, has its own life and character. Mm. Fantastic. <laughs> um, well, I will ask one more question. Uh, I think, oh, yep. We have some people saying thank you for thank all you. of, for your contribution. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll have one more question for you guys. Um, I think what we're seeing is a lot of, like you said, Stephen, a lot of similarity between the work you're creating. Um, do both of you think that um, you both were on track to kind of create similar work? Is there um, a, a language that goes back and forth between the two of you during your creative processes? You know, is it a combination of those things? Well, I mean, again, it goes way back to the, the bar days of, of drawing on the beer decals. Mm -hmm. Immediately when we, I mean, I just went to visit her in Cologne. Um, we weren't at all together or anything. And we just went out and had a beer or somewhere and we started drawing. And immediately the drawings were just so easy to do together. Mm -hmm. And it was just so obvious that we had a similar feeling, you know. And um, that's grown and grown and grown. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it has all it. kind of different levels. When we also do a, a collaboration exhibition, we are sometimes, I, I start a piece and he continues it or the other way around, or we make completely um, separate work, but it's tied together by the same theme. Um, and, and the amazing thing of being, an artist couple is also when we do our individual work, I mean, Stephen is my the best critic I could wish for because he is super honest and tells me, you know, don't do it that way. That looks horrible, do it this way. So we are very supportive also uh, when we're doing our separate work as well, because we, we know, you know, we, we feel what the other person wants to express and, we see the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to echo what everybody's saying in the chat. It has been wonderful well, to, to hear your story. Thank you so much for everything that you've contributed tonight. Yes, thank you, everybody. And thank you to both of you from me as well. And of course, Stephen, your shirt, we must point out your shirt and <laughs> you're <laughs> cheering on Millville and the Thunderbolt. Bolts. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Go uh, um, so good evening everyone this wraps up our program and i you can check out the chat for the the links that i dropped in there earlier and um keep in touch and and follow um sabella and stephen on your own. Uh, I would invite you as well in, to look in the chat for the link to upcoming Wheaton Conversations. Sign up and I bid you good night. Keep in touch with Pam and myself. If you have any questions, be sure and get in touch with us. Good night Thank all. Thank you everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank good you night. again. It was wonderful to see you and work with you both. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh.